Uh, good morning, everyone can hear me? Uh, great, so um, my name's Nick Schmidl. Uh, I'm a uh, former fellow here, actually, uh, and a staff writer at The New Yorker, and I am just delighted to um, have the opportunity to uh, introduce Hugh Digit today uh, and to talk a bit about his book, and uh, so thank you all so much for coming out. Um, I think what we'll do is talk, Hugh Digit and I can talk for the first 20, 25 minutes, and then I imagine there's going to be all sorts of questions, both uh, questions specifically pertaining to the book and questions pertaining to the issues that the book has raised about more contemporary um, cases, and so we can sort of spin off from there. And uh, um, So uh, I guess where should we start, you digit? Um, for, yeah, I mean, again, thank you for, for, for inviting me to do this. This is delightful. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, th and thanks to the Wilson Center, where I was a fellow um, January through May of 2015, when I was actually hard at work on this book. Uh, so it, it, it's, uh, it's very nice to, uh, to be able to speak to all of you here at this great institution. Um, Nick has been a friend of mine. Uh, he's obviously a very accomplished journalist. I'm really glad that you're doing this, Nick, uh, with me. I'm delighted to talk to you about the book. So let's get started. Great. So um, I guess my first question is, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about how you found this story in this case and uh, a bit about sort of, you know, your g give us the backstory of how, how you sort of ended up working on this project. Great. I'd love to talk about that. Um, so I, I actually came across this case of Brian Regan, which uh, – who in the book is the spy who couldn't spell. Um, I, I came across the case back in 2009. I, on a lark, I had gone to the FBI lab in Quantico uh, to interview a cryptanalyst, and I wanted to hear about his, his life story. His name was Dan Olson. Uh, and he told me about a variety of cases, and most of them involved codes that prison gangs use um, to communicate with each other. And then right at the end of his little 10-minute talk to me, he described this case. Uh, and he said, you know, I, I worked on solving some of the codes that this spy, Brian Regan, had used. And I thought, surely, this is an old case, uh, old at least by newspaper standards. Um, the conviction had occurred in 2003, and I thought, surely, people have written about this. But when I dug deeper, I saw that it hadn't been covered at all, and the reason was that Brian Regan was arrested two weeks before 911, and he was convicted one month after the U.S. invaded Iraq. So it was almost as if he, his story uh, was kind of bookended by these two major events, and uh, it was sort of low-hanging fruit for me to go after. And what uh, – to rewind a little bit, the, the your interest in, in going to this cryptologist, you have a background in science writing, so you, you're sort of comfortable delving into – I mean, cryptology, if, if, if you read the book and you get to the cryptology section, uh, so I think everyone except hardcore cryptologists are going to say, <laughs> all right, hold on, so let me go get a cup of coffee here. <laughs> this is serious <laughs> stuff. Can you talk about a little bit about you, where was your interest in uh, cryptology, or what was your interest in cryptology before that? Were you working on something or just kind of developing some like – You know, I didn't really have uh, a, a specific interest in cryptology. I was – I'm a science writer. I, I worked at Science Magazine for many years, um, and when I actually went to the FBI lab, I was, uh, I, I was working at Science. Um, I, I was interested in codes. I was interested in this idea of – of hiding things from others. Uh, I've always been fascinated by characters who do that, and I guess uh, the making and breaking of codes involves hiding and deception. Uh, so that was my sort of general interest, but I wasn't kind of mathematically drawn to codes or anything like that. But once I dug deeper into the Brian Regan story, uh, I, I started learning more about codes. I, I started learning more about the history of codes um, what, what's interesting about Brian Regan is that even though he went through a couple of cryptology courses um, during his military training, he wasn't really a cryptologist in the formal sense. Mm -hmm. And so he came up with these codes himself. Uh, he kind of invented them. I guess invented is a strong word, but, but he used some very unconventional techniques mm -hmm. to come up with these codes. And that's partly why they proved to be so difficult to break. 
Okay, let's talk a little bit about Brian Regan himself. So Brian Regan is the is the the spy who couldn't spell. Um, give us a, a sort of thumbnail sketch of who Brian Regan was and how he found himself in this predicament. Sure, uh, Brian Regan was a um, he was an employee of the Air Force. Uh, he joined the Air Force in in 1980. Uh, he had grown up with severe dyslexia, and as a result of that, he didn't do very well in school. He was also mocked by his peers, his classmates, his friends in the neighborhood, not just because of his dyslexia, but because of certain quirks in his personality, which, uh, which you can read all about in the book. Um, he, 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 he did pretty well for himself, even though uh, he actually had to cheat on the tests, the military tests, to get in to the Air Force. Uh, he did well enough to be absorbed into Air Force intelligence as a signals analyst. Uh, he did pretty well uh, for 10 to 12 years. He served admirably uh, during the first Gulf War in 1991. He was at the Pentagon uh, doing signals analysis to help uh, the armed forces. And then in 1995, he came to the National Reconnaissance Office, which is this agency that manages uh, all of the military spy satellites that the, that the U.S. government has. Uh, these are multi-billion dollar satellites. You know, they've taken years and years to develop. There's been decades of R&D behind them. And, and these, the images that these satellites gather and the signals intelligence that these satellites collect are what gives the United States uh, its, its great military superiority in the world. Um, so. Starting in 1997, because Brian Regan was, was facing hardships in his financial life, he was under severe credit card debt. Uh, his wife wasn't happy because of um, how much he was making. He had a large family, relatively speaking. He had four kids. Um, and, and he was, you know, he was frustrated. He was, he was also frustrated because of the lack of respect at the workplace, even though he was a fairly decent worker. Uh, but again, just like it had happened in childhood, he kept getting mocked, uh, he kept getting ridiculed uh, by some of his colleagues. And so sometime in 1998, he came up with the plan that he was going to steal American secrets and he was going to try to market them uh, overseas to hostile governments. And so he, he came up with the espionage plan sometime in 1998, 99. Um, and he went through a meticulous process of collecting these secrets, uh, which actually collecting them by itself wasn't that hard. And that's something that we can talk about later about the vulnerability of, of the secrets that he had access to, um, much in the same way that Snowden and Manning later had access to them. But, uh, but to make a long story short, he, he tried, he, he actually succeeded in stealing the secrets. He succeeded in hiding them in these two state parks outside of DC in Patapsco Valley State Park and Pocahontas State Park. Uh, and he came up with this ingenious method of burying them and then encrypting the geo coordinates of all of these locations. And so what he had in the end of his uh, theft was simply a sh you know, sheets, of, uh, sheets filled with letters and numbers that wouldn't mean anything to anybody else, uh, but were essentially the keys to the kingdom. So if you haven't already bought the book in the course of, of, of that explanation on Amazon, there are also books for sale that you digitally will be signing after this. But I mean, it's a phenomenal story. And I think that one of the things that you do very well is, um, you give this sense of, of what motivated him. Oftentimes that's, you know, people are always looking for motivation and it oftentimes comes down to money and money was, I think, a factor here, but it was this, this sort of proving himself and not to be, you know, you use the word not to be a dolt, you know, that that was the, 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 the um, sort of impression that he was trying to wrestle himself out of, uh, you know, you, this o great opening scene where he visits his high school and you can sort of see these two worlds colliding. So I, I thought that was phenomenal and getting into the psychology of this guy as well. Um, you referenced S Snowden and Manning. Both of them played a kind of system admin-ish role, right? Where they sort of, they, they, they were not necessarily, 
privy. They weren't. They they had. They only had a right to know those secrets and a right to access those secrets as a result of of their sort of technical expertise, not as a result necessarily of their espionage specialty. Is that correct? That's that's right. Um, and I would say, if you were to compare Brian Regan to these two individuals. Um, Brian Regan had experience. He knew the value of signals intelligence very specifically because he had helped to collect it. He had helped to analyze it. Um, at the NRO, his job, part of his job, involved maintaining the web page for his particular group. And so he had certain privileges. I don't know exactly what they were, but he was quite familiar with how uh, all of this information that was stored on the servers had to be used by the military uh, in war and in peace. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that that gave him, that made him dangerous. Uh, well, given his intent, it made him dangerous uh, because he had both access, he had knowledge, and he knew the value of these things. And he knew uh, which governments might value which kind of information. So if you read the book, you will find that he went through a process of sorting all of the classified material that he had he had stolen uh, in order to create separate packages, some of them containing the same information, create separate packages for the governments of Libya and and Iraq. Yes, indeed. And and in fact Iran too. And and he so the NRO, just real quick, what's one of the things that I think is interesting is we, we associate uh, even sort of a pre-Snowden era, the NSA secrets were sort of, you know, we always associate the CIA with being the sort of the spookiest of the spookies. And the NRO and, and with the, the NSA, that intelligence is oftentimes far more valuable because of these, these like you said, incredibly expensive platforms, right? I mean, so can you talk a bit about the sort of the NRO being the, the, the spy agency that no one's heard of that is actually – Sort of ha has these that's, a, that's a great question, and I spent some time in the book uh, sort of describing what the NRO is, why it was important. Um, so the NRO, until 1992, the American public didn't even know that the NRO existed uh, because it was just this little office uh, within the Air Force, completely classified. Even its existence was not known, and there were people who worked in intelligence agencies like the FBI who had no idea where, you know, what the NRO was. Mm -hmm. um, in 1992, it was declassified, so the existence became known. Um, and, and so that's when the public started to get a slight glimpse of what this multi-billion dollar agency did. Since the, 19, since the late 50s, uh, this is the agency that, that sort of first came up with all the technology um, to uh, to photograph and collect signals intelligence from space. Um, and this is, you know, through the 60s, there were several improvements made. The American public didn't know mm. anything mm. about it. 70s, 80s, and, and that's when people started to get wind of it. Uh, so, in short, the NRO collects two types of intelligence, mainly. One is photographic intelligence, uh, just images, high-resolution images of, uh, of of military installations, of weapons depots. There's uh, a picture of, of Gaddafi's yacht, right? Yes, yeah, that, that that's thing. that's actually right. And it, it turns out that that particular image was not taken by the NRO. It was taken by another Middle Eastern um, uh, spy agency. But y y in the book, you'll find why that is relevant. You you, you bring up a, a nice nice point, but. But uh, but yes, the the incredible amount of detail that these photographs were able to show, as the NRO improved its capabilities, have been instrumental in in winning wars. Um, and and in fact, the work that Brian Regan did uh, during the first Gulf War, he wasn't the the only one, of course. Uh, that you know, th those were were sort of critical to um, to so easily overpowering the Iraqi forces when when Iraq had invaded uh, Kuwait. That was the imagery that we, uh, that the, the US special operators and SEALs had in the raid on the bin Laden uh, compound was also all NRO, uh, essentially NR NRO sources. Yes, in fact, uh, one of those, one of the individuals who was involved in collecting the intelligence uh, that led to the bin Laden raid, which 
by the way, uh, Nick has, has written uh, a terrific piece on for The New Yorker uh, a few years ago. Um, that, that one, of the, one of the individuals uh, connected to that intelligence was called to testify in the Brian Regan trial. And um, I tried very hard to interview him, but the agency didn't make, make that person available just because they knew that I might also start nosing around and asking about bin Laden. Right, right, right. Um, so, so, okay, so, so we've got, we sort of talked about at a macro level what the NRO was doing and what the U.S. public did or didn't know. Uh, let's go sort of more micro. Brian Regan is accumulating all this information and collecting all this information in his house uh, and, then, and then stashing it in the woods. Um, his family does, has suspicions, doesn't have suspicions. What could you talk a little bit about how sort of how he managed to keep that secret from colleagues and family? Um, and then eventually how he was how he was outed. So Brian Regan was a, a recluse. Uh, he was, you know, he was closed off. He didn't really have friends at the NRO. Uh, he didn't have many friends in his neighborhood. And uh, as his wife told me, you know, many years later when I was working on the book, um, that, you know, he's not somebody that I that I even knew. Uh, and and so the the layers of deception that he was able to deploy um, are as fascinating as the code that he created. I mean, in the book, I describe him as being a code uh, that I sought to sort of unravel through my reporting. Uh, he, you know, he he stashed the materials uh, first at the NRO itself in one of his cabinets. And there's a scene in the book where he goes off um, on travel duty, and the NRO, um, the NRO office managers uh, come and they were they're removing excess furniture, and they take away this cabinet, uh, and then they unlock it, and they discover all these papers in it, and they say, oh, it probably belongs to this guy, and then when he returns, they call him and say, hey, uh, there's uh, it was actually a credenza. They say, hey, there's all this stuff you had. Do, do, you, do, is, do you need it? And he says, oh, yeah, sure, please. Uh, and, uh, and they send it back to him. So you know, some, of the, some of the security lapses are simply laughable um, and, uh, and certainly should, should concern us. But, uh, but aside from that, he did a good job himself of keeping it uh, a secret. When he brought it home and he was sorting it, his wife and his kids were away, and so he was able to sort it in his basement. And then soon after that, he took it out. He first actually stored it in a public storage facility um, while he was kind of putting his plan together. So there were multiple steps to how he, he stored this information. Of course, Snowden didn't have to do any of this. Not that you know, Snowden was a traitor in this, in this particular sense. Uh, it's debatable, you know, whether what he did was entirely good or bad, but but at least he did take information that he wasn't supposed to take, and and in so far as that goes, Snowden didn't have to go through the trouble of printing stuff out, and you know, putting it in a credenza, <laughs> and then putting it in Tupperware containers and burying it in the middle of a forest as Brian Regan had to. So so he sorted this he sorted his piles he. Um, he then sends a letter to the Libyan embassy. That's right. So he he goes through great pains to first uh, create a letter that's entirely coded, and then he creates a creates a code sheet, and so he sends out a letter that's really in sort of three parts. It has the code sheet, it has the code book, or rather the instructions for how to resolve the code, and then there's this letter which is entirely coded. Uh, and and so all of this is his way of trying to remain anonymous because he's he's really really paranoid about being found out as as anybody would be. Uh, so it's he sends these to the Libyan embassy. Uh, he addresses the letter to Saddam Hussein. Sorry, to to Gaddafi. He actually has a separate letter that goes out to Saddam Hussein. Um, and and one of these. Actually, all of these letters get intercepted by the FBI and by a, source they had. by a source they had in the Libyan embassy. I never actually figured out, uh, I never got much clarity on that, and 
you know, justifiably so because the FBI needs to protect its sources and methods. Um, and, uh, and that's how the spy hunt began. And it took several months for the FBI to figure out who had sent those letters. Just, just given that they take the hunt itself and run it, to, to talk a little bit about the, the craft of... Oh, sorry. Um, to talk a little bit about the craft of your own investigation and reporting and writing. Uh, how much did you sort of struggle with wanting to uncover all of the sources and methods to be able to see exactly how they did it and also respecting the fact that the FBI has sources and methods that they, like, you know, your own sort of personal journalistic ambitions, uh, how do they, how do they, if or how do they contradict the uh, professional ambitions of the FBI and, and, and their own sort of protection of sources and methods? Well, um, I, I knew that this was an important part of the story, but I knew that there was, you know, that was just sort of the beginning of the story. And I was happy enough to let that lie, really, because after all, I needed all these agents to talk to me for the next two years, telling me how they cracked the case. And if I if I'd gotten hung up on how they got the tip and just insisted on finding that out, well, this book wouldn't be here. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I didn't think that it was germane to the story. Um, However, when I saw in the prosecution phase the lengths to which the government had to go to build the case without bringing in the informant, I knew how important it was mm. to keep the informant behind the scenes. And, uh, and later on, when I discussed this with counterintelligence agents, um, I learned that you know, there could be tremendous risk to this individual. Um, he could have immediately been, been killed by the Gaddafi regime yeah. for having uh, betrayed, for having essentially done, you know, what Brian Regan was seeking to do to this country. Yeah, yeah. Was there, was there, um, there's this uh, uh, concept of gray mail in, in U.S. public prosecutions where in cases, in counterintelligence uh, cases, as they're bringing the evidence, oftentimes the, the prosecution will say, okay, this guy is a criminal, but we can't tell you how we got what we got, and then they'll have these sort of private, um, secure conversations. W was there gray mailing? Was there an attempt by Reagan's lawyers to try and gray mail the government into giving up this informant to try and jeopardize or compromise him? Well, in fact, the case, you know, was that's exactly what Brian Regan did. Brian Regan knew that the government would not be able to um, bring in this informant to testify. He didn't know exactly who had, you know, who had tipped off the FBI. But he knew that even if the FBI presented these letters, these anonymous letters in court, they would have a hard time sort of showing that these letters were actually sent to an embassy. Right. Uh, and, and so he attempted to, to blackmail the government by saying, look, um, I'm not giving anything up, and, uh, and I, I think that I deserve less than nine years in prison for what I've done. Uh, and only if you give me that short sentence, relatively speaking, uh, will I help you to dig up the secrets that I have buried. Mm. And so this, wa this was highly unusual, and this was, I think, this was think probably the worst. The word yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, this was the worst judgment call that Brian Regan could have made. And, and that's what, what fascinated me. Uh, and I wanted to dig deeper into his life to understand uh, what kind of childhood and adolescence and, and youth he had had that would lead him to think in this way mm. that he could outsmart and outmaneuver the government uh, after being caught with his, with his pants down. All right, so let's talk a little bit. So he, he tries to outsmart and outmaneuver the government in the prosecution stage and sort of in the legal phase. Uh, let's, the chase itself, the letter comes in. Um, you have this this fantastic FBI agent as your sort of protagonist. Um, uh, talk about what what's how do they build the case against Regan and how do they go after him and eventually get him? Right. So um, so the first uh, phase of the investigation was was just identifying who this who this person was and and so they cast a wide net. You know they they looked at the NSA, they looked at the CIA, and by the way the the, the counterintelligence people within the CIA said, oh this can't be our guy. Uh, you know, because of all the bad spelling 
in, 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 these, in these letters uh, because we have you know, much more elite uh, people who serve in our agency. Riddled with spelling <laughs> errors would be an <laughs> accurate way to put it. You read this and you think, that's ouch. You know. That's right. And, and so, so this was, in fact, just as a side note, this is what fascinated me about Regan because he would go, he would be so meticulous, he would be so smart, and then he would do one thing that would be so dumb uh, that would completely, you know, that would be the end of his of his plot, and this happens repeatedly through the story I discovered. But uh, back to the chase, uh, the 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 FBI uh, started to do audits of these these uh, of the servers to see who had accessed certain things. And what what Brian Regan had done is, as a sample of the intelligence that he was going to sell, uh, he had he had printed out several documents from Intel Link, which is the classified internet of the intelligence community. And he had included 23 or, or 24 pages, basically about 19 documents in his package that he had mailed. And so that was the clue that, um, that the FBI was trying to connect to uh, whoever the mailer of the, of the package was. Uh, so to make a long story short, um, Eventually, the FBI found one particular document that had been printed out on July the 9th of 1999, and they were able to narrow down the number of people who had accessed that document on that particular day. Uh, and that's when Brian Regan's name sort of came to the forefront. They also had other clues. You know, they were looking for a bad speller. And and when they looked into Brian Regan's files, you know the letters that he had written, his email communications, they could tell that that he was probably their guy. Um, but you know, in intelligence investigations are are incredibly complex. Uh, if they are to hold up in court, there's a whole lot of evidence because all the defense has to do is to just inject reasonable doubt. Uh, and so they went through. Um, a long process of first confirming that he indeed had done it, and there are moments in the story, for example, when he, when he's seen going into a library in Crofton, Maryland, uh, where FBI agents are watching him, and he's doing these searches for the addresses of Libyan embassies and Iraqi embassies uh, in uh, in Europe. And once again, as a side note, you know he goes through incredible. Uh, you know, effort to cover his tracks, and then he leaves the browser open when he walks off from the from the terminal. Uh, you know, if he had just refreshed it, you know, they they would not have been able to see what what he had been looking at. Uh, so that's just just an example of of Brian Regan's uh, why Brian Regan came to be known as Mister Eighty Percent by the FBI agents because, you know, they 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 would they would see that. You know, he was brilliant 80% of the way, and then suddenly he would make a left turn to stupidity. Um, so <laughs> so um, once they knew that he was their guy, they still needed to collect evidence that he was doing something because they didn't know what he had stolen even at that point. Um, they, were, they were simply starting to see that he had done all these searches on Intel Link. Uh, so... They ultimately, they brought him back to the NRO as a contractor, which was a risky move. And uh, they, they rigged up cameras in his cubicles so that they could watch his every move, his every keystroke. And then finally, when he was about to leave the country to market this information uh, to the embassies overseas, that's when they finally got him. So, so he never... He never s successfully passed off any of that in, uh, of the of the uh, intelligence reports that he was proposed that he was attempting to sell. Did the fact that he had obtained them and the fact that they had sort of uh, 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 that they had been accessed and they were no longer within the confines of Intel Link and the intelligence community did that jeopardize all of the sources and methods that were used to 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 gather all of that information? Or were they able to preserve those? Do you know? So, uh, so I guess you're asking whether there was a risk still outstanding, even though he hadn't been able to sell this information. Well, I guess the question is, like, the person who took the photograph of Gaddafi's yacht, yeah. when they know that he had that photograph in his possession, 
does that then mean that the person who took the photograph is potentially, is, is no longer usable because he's somehow compromised, even if not in a significant way? Yeah, uh, yeah, so, so I'll just rephrase that question. I mean, since, since that particular photograph was taken by another intel agency, one of our allies in the Middle East, um, there wasn't any particular risk stemming just from that photograph. But all of the materials that he had stolen and he had buried um, would have compromised billions of dollars worth of assets had they been found. And keep in mind that even after he was arrested, he wasn't giving up anything. He wasn't pleading guilty. He wasn't saying, here's what I did, here's how I did it, and I swear to God, I haven't actually given any of this stuff to anyone. So the FBI thought, well, he may have given stuff up. Uh, he, there might be, you know, he may have already communicated with a hostile intelligence, uh, giving them some of these locations where he might have buried stuff. They didn't even know that he had buried stuff in parks. That was not evident from the evidence that they had collected. They just knew that, you know, he'd made stops at parks. He had this habit of going into the forest. You know, they were trying to piece all of this together. Mm -hmm. So that's the interesting part about the case. While there was no damage done, the potential of damage was so great that the FBI had no choice but to dig up each of these packages, which they didn't know existed at that point. All they knew was that he had printed stuff out because in his letter to the Libyans, he had said, I have printed out 800 pages of documents. Turns out he had printed out 20,000 pages of documents. Mm -hmm. wow. um, so, so, there was, so it was critical even after his arrest to find what he had done and then to recover whatever he had stolen. And that process took about one and a half years. Uh, so let's um, open it up for questions. I'll continue to ask questions if, if no one else has any. But, but I, I imagine that there have to be some, uh, and we can sort of make this more of a group conversation. Does anyone uh, want to raise your hand? And do we have microphones that we're going to pass out? OK. Um, anyone? Questions? Sure. Up front? Uh, my name is Stephen Shaw. Wonderful talk. Do you think deep down he wanted to get caught? I don't think he wanted to get caught. I think he wanted to be able to say to himself, aha, I outsmarted them all. Uh, and so it was, it was sort of an internal need for validation that he was after. Of course he was after the money because, you know, he was in, he was in bad debt. Uh, but I think that because of the ridicule that he had suffered throughout his life, he just had this personality of trying to prove that he was, he had an ace up his sleeve that nobody else knew about. Uh, and, and that is what led him to make those bad decisions after he was arrested, frankly, because if he had, if he had simply fessed up at that point, he wouldn't be spending the rest of his life in prison. In the back. Thanks. <clears throat> Dan Raviv with CBS News. Uh, fascinating story. As far as the cryptology goes, was it especially challenging because his code was meant only to be understood by himself, not shared with any agency or any um, allies of his? Yes, uh, I, you, you make a good point. He was, you know, he was trying to hide it so in case he got caught, nobody would figure out what it was and he would still be able to recover these locations. Um, but there is a theory that he might have communicated these codes and the way to break them to another intelligence service, you know, if that, had that been required to execute his plot fully. But, but yes, uh, he came up with certain weird ways of, in, of encrypting these coordinates and that certainly, because it was personal in nature, that made it harder for the FBI to crack it. Do, do you, uh, that theory that he may have had contact of some sort, do you, where did your reporting leave you thinking? I don't think that he, he actually was able to make contact. There's a scene in the book where s sometime in June of 2001, this is about two months before he got arrested, he did actually fly to Europe and he did go to the Libyan embassy, and he went in, and he, he said, can I speak to your security officer? 
And he was trying to tell them that he had information that he wanted to sell. But because of his bumbling ways and because of the way he came across, he immediately came across as a provocation that maybe he was just a dangle. You know, in the intelligence world, uh, you know, agencies do this all the time. Intelligence agencies will send one of their own uh, to pretend uh, to be a spy uh, into, you know, uh, another consulate or, or, or uh, to knock on the doors of another intelligence service. And so he got booted out, you know, uh, of this. And, and I think this is partly because of his personality. If he had sort of, if he, kn he didn't know, he thought he knew all about spying, but he actually didn't. And that's true for everything he did. He thought he knew he was smarter than everybody else thought, but he was not as smart as he thought he was. Uh, and so he, he ended up, um, uh, you know, he ended up making mistakes like that. If, if he had in indeed studied spycraft, he might have found a way to first make contact with somebody at the embassy to introduce himself bit by bit. I mean, I mean, if you read some of these other successful spy stories, well, success being a, you know, being a, a loaded term, uh, but, but cases where traders were, s were successful in selling information, you will see that, you know, they didn't go to great lengths to hide the information in the way that Regan did, but they went to great lengths to establish a relationship with, with uh, you know, with whatever intelligence service that they were going to work for. Mm. Life lesson, don't be arrogant. Um, sir, go ahead. Understanding that we, g given that we don't know all the particulars of the Harold Martin case yet that just came up, and, and given that it seem, seems like his intent was perhaps rather different than Brian Regan's, um, can you comment on how when this case happened so many years before the Harold Martin case, just about sort of the physical security aspects of like, why did the NSA let Harold Martin take home so many documents physically? Well, it stumps me as much as it stumps you. Um, in fact, I, I recently wrote an op-ed for the New York Times uh, precisely at, you know, asking that question. Um, the Brian Regan case offers so many lessons about both digital secu security as well as physical security of, of classified secrets. But because his case happened uh, right before 911, um, it somehow got lost. Even within the intelligence community, there are many who have never heard of the Brian Regan case. And so I think that the lessons that should have been learned about how to protect secrets in the digital age were just never taken seriously. They weren't applied until many years later. And even now, I think, you know, the, the arms race sort of continues between insider threats who are planning to do something like this, be it for espionage purposes or for other, you know, more supposedly noble purposes. Um, there's, there's just, uh, I've lost my tra train of thought, but, but there's, uh, yeah, right. Right, right. And so I, I, I have no idea how Harold Martin was able to take thumb drives and CD-ROMs and whatnot containing classified information and then store it in his garage for years. I mean, maybe he started taking them, you know, back in 2003. Who knows? Um, no one else have questions, really? Is that possible? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in your process of collecting the information. <coughs> your your bio doesn't seem like you're super connected into the CIA, the NSA, and all that. So how hard was it for you to sort of get all the different folks to talk? Uh, it, was, it wasn't that hard to get the lead case agent, Steve Carr, to talk. Um, you know, I, I first came across the story, like I was telling Nick earlier, back in 2009 when I'd gone to interview Dan Olson, the cryptologist who worked on the case. Uh, 
Uh, and I ended up writing a piece for Wired magazine just about the cryptology part. It was, you know, it, it didn't go into much detail, but it sort of briefly covered the hunt for these secrets. Uh, and after I'd done that, I sort of became friends with the lead agent, uh, Steve, Steve Carr. Uh, and, and as we talked, I could sort of gather that there was more to the story, that there was a lot more that, you know, that could be told. At, th at the time, I didn't know what that was. I just had a vague notion, but I kept pursuing it. Ultimately, I was able to get, you know, some cooperation from the FBI because unlike most espionage cases, this one had gone to trial, and so there was quite a bit of information already in the public domain because of that. Uh, but then once I started sort of going through witness testimonies and you know, Nick can tell you all about this process, this investigative process. Uh, I started finding people who knew bits and pieces. You know, some 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 of them had retired. There were others who were willing to talk. You know, just because I knew Steve and and they knew that I'd done a good job on this Wired article. It just took years and years to actually get everything together. What was more difficult was to to find enough. Uh, information about Brian Regan's childhood because, believe it or not, when somebody gets branded as a spy, nobody wants to claim that they ever knew him. I mean, it's, I mean, it's worse than being a pedophile, really, uh, because it's so, so deeply stigmatized uh, that anybody who's been accused of treason uh, is, you know, you don't want to touch that person with a 10-foot pole. Mm -hmm. So it took me a, a great deal of effort to track down friends of Brian Regan from childhood so that I could slowly, bit by bit, piece together the story of his dysfunctional growing up years and then bring that to bear through some of the decisions that he made. And, and, and your access to uh, your attempts to sort of get in touch with Regan himself, I was talking to Adam about that. Yeah, so Regan, you know, for, for five years I fought a battle with the Department of Justice uh, and the NRO and a few other agencies trying to communicate with Brian. Uh, Brian Regan is one of maybe 50 to 100 uh, federal prisoners who are under what's known as special administrative measures. Uh, these are special terms of incarceration that prevent um, people like Regan and the Boston Bomber, for instance, from being able to communicate freely with the outside world. Uh, and and so I just I never got that permission. The the ostensible reason being that because Regan was this unpredictable character, he might divulge something in his interviews with me, just to get back at the government, and to to further harm national security. Um, even though you know it's been it's been more than ten years. Well, it's it's actually been thirteen years now that that he has been in prison. Uh, so, so I, I was I was not able to speak to him, but I was able to collect a lot of information uh, from a psychiatrist that the defense team had employed to to speak to him. Um, I was also able to dig up uh, some notes that a government psychiatrist had made from interviewing Brian Regan right before the trial began, just to assess if he was in a in a in a sound mental condition. Uh, these were not covered, you know, these, these notes were not covered by any sort of privacy rules and that's why I was able to access them. Um, so I was able to connect a lot of dots speaking to his friends, these, uh, these notes from the psychiatrist, which, were, which was basically the transcript of an interview that the psychiatrist had done with Brian Regan. And then most importantly, um, the NRO and the FBI debriefed Brian Regan for over 25 or, or 30 sessions uh, after all of the secrets had been dug up. Uh, and and they, they went over with him precisely what he had done and why he had done it and when he had done it. Uh, and I benefited from the agents who were in the room when those conversations were taking place. I didn't, you know, I, d I wasn't able to, to get the recordings of these sessions. They exist. Uh, 
anyone knows how to get those, you can send them to you, Digit. He'll provide his address later. Um, the, uh, will you be, are you able to send a book? Will you be able to send a book to him? I would like to be able to send a book. Um, I, I, you know, I've, I've tried sending him letters, but they keep getting intercepted. Uh, and, you know, and, and also I couldn't try anything funny like asking his, one of his family members to send a letter because, you know, then they would stop his contact with family members. I mean, it just, you know, at some point I had to draw the line. I couldn't Not about go a code? <laughs> <laughs> It it would have been it would have been interesting, um, <laughs> especially if I if I had misspelled his name. <laughs> he he would have very easily misspelled mine, I'm sure. <laughs> so, um, uh, other questions? Yes, sir. Are there any congressional oversight uh, over these happenings and the? I'm sorry. Has there been any congressional oversight over this case and and the? Uh, security lapses and, and apparently security lapses after the arrest? Yes. Uh, the, you know, while the case was going on, during the investigation, there were briefings done on the Hill, you know, in closed, closed room sessions. Uh, and I'm sure that such briefings are pretty routine from security lapses. I don't know, you know, what changes have been made as a result. I know that the NRO made several changes and improved its digital security. So not to knock on them, I mean, they, you know, they ultimately were able to salvage the situation by cooperating with the FBI, um, and ultimately no damage was done. And, and I think that's the weird thing about this case, that even though he got away with stealing the information, he ultimately wasn't able to pass it on to a foreign service. And so from a broad counterintelligence perspective, it seems like, oh, no harm, no foul. Let's let's brush this under the carpet and forget about it. But actually, <laughs> you know, Manning and Snowden and and now Harold Martin. I don't know if he's you know. I think the Justice Department is talking about charging him, charging Martin with espionage. Um, all of these, and this is this is not a threat that has gone away. You know, this is th th we're we're just we're just seeing one example where the person was caught and no real damage was done. But there, there must be at least a few out there, um, and and it's the job of the FBI and and other agencies to to weed them out. Other questions? Um, all right, I'll just ask a, a last one that I was curious about. Well, what uh, in in the years of reporting and the access to documents and the conversations with all the players, what surprised you most? What what was the conversation that you left and you thought, wow, like I never, that just shined a light on an aspect of either espionage or counterintelligence that that you had not anticipated. You know, it was more about human character. That you know, I was I was really surprised when I learned that Brian Regan, just as he was about to bury uh, these packages out in Pocahontas, um, he he actually sorted all of the information one last time, and he discovered some documents that he thought were very, very sensitive. Uh, and he decided that they were so sensitive that he was not going to sell them. And, and so he tried to uh, flush them down the toilet of his motel room. And of course, that didn't work. And so he sort of picked all of that up out of the toilet and then put it in the bathtub, and then tried to mulch it, and uh, and he just he just let the water run, and he tried to st stomp on it, and tried to sort of destroy these documents. He wasn't able to do that. He ultimately just you know wrapped it all up and and threw it uh, into a dumpster. And so I I was I I found it very strange that somebody who had embarked on uh, what was a clear plan to commit espionage, somebody who didn't give a damn about the consequences. Uh, you know, I mean, he, he, he was obviously concerned about the consequences for himself, but didn't give a damn about the consequences to the country. Uh, that he should have had this kind of stirring of conscience. And so that, uh, that made me think about the complication in Brian's character. And, and so from all the reporting that I did after I learned of this this incident, 
um, I I discovered that Brian Regan was was a really, you know, he he was he was a troubled human being. He had difficulties growing up. He had overcome a lot of challenges to have the career that that he had, and yet his quest for respect, you know, just kept getting stymied. You know, he would he would get to eighty percent, and then something would happen, and and he would find himself back at square one. And this just happened over and over with him. Uh, and so I, I, I never thought when I started this project that I would have sympathy for a guy who decided to, to commit espionage, um, especially when I was hearing the story told by people like Steve Carr and you know all the people who hunted him down and brought him to justice. But as I learned more about his childhood, uh, and his and his dysfunctional life, I I, I I felt very sorry for him, and I didn't expect to feel sorry. For, so that was, I guess, the the biggest surprise to me. Right. So come come for the codes and stay for the character development, right? Um, all right. Well, we will all uh, we're all going to read the book. When, when are we going to get to watch the movie? Um, well, <laughs> coming to a theater uh, <laughs> soon. I, I I don't know. There there. You know, I think uh, it's a really interesting story. I, I think it's ripe for movie treatment um, because at the heart of the book is a really complicated character, uh, a really fun chase, uh, and the, the story doesn't end with Brian Regan getting caught. It actually goes on uh, because there's a cat and mouse game that continues even after Brian Regan is in prison. So I think it would make a great movie. Well, thank you all so much for coming, uh, and you did it. Thanks for the awesome book, and, and thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you all. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks for the question.